that people want to know who a man is before they listen to what he's said. So I am the only child of a single mother, born in 1928, a long time ago, which makes me 85. Temaninina Tano. Nilifika apo Nairobi, mwaka absini na tisa, how many don't understand Swahili here? Now on a Sabbath too. And it's a great privilege for me to be here. I was here before World Vision was here. And I've known all your directors from the first, Ken Tracy, uh, who came somewhere in the 70s. So it's a great privilege for me to be here today and to be sharing with you. Uh, I have so many stories that you're going to have to pray that the Holy Spirit will override the flesh in this man today and only give you what you're supposed to get for your own spiritual nourishment. So I'm going to go straight into the uh, devotional and we'll leave the getting to know one another uh, to another opportunity. The Wednesday of Holy Week is thought to be the day of the Olivet Discourse, it's called. Jesus went with his disciples up the side of the Mount of Olives and spoke about the future that they could expect. So my subject today is an Easter view of the future. You'll find the story repeated three times in the Gospels. It's in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And I will read the passage that is appropriate uh, from Luke 21. Some of the disciples were talking about the temple, how beautiful it looked with its fine stones and gifts offered to God. And Jesus said, all this you see, the time will come when not a single stone here will be left in its place. Everyone will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will this be? And what will happen in order to show that the time has come for it to take place? Jesus said, be on your guard. Don't be deceived. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am he, and the time has come, but don't follow them. Don't be afraid when you hear of wars and revolutions. Such things must happen first, but they do not mean the end is near. He went on to say, countries will fight each other. Kingdoms will attack each other. There will be terrible earthquakes, famines, plagues everywhere, and there will be strange and terrifying things coming from the sky. And before all these things take place, however, you will be arrested and persecuted, and you will be handed over to be tried in synagogues and put in prison, and you will be brought before kings and rulers for my sake. This will be your chance to tell the good news. Make up your minds beforehand not to worry about how you will defend yourselves. Because I will give you such words and wisdom that none of your enemies will be able to refute or contradict what you say. You will be handed over by your parents, your brothers, your relatives and your friends and some of you will be put to death and everyone will hate you because of me but not a single hair from your head will be lost stand firm and you will save yourselves and when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies then you will know that she will soon be destroyed then those who are in Judea must run away to the hills, and those who are in the city must leave 
and those who are out in the country must not go into the city for those will be the days of punishment to make all that the scriptures say come true and how terrible it will be in those days for women who are pregnant and for mothers with little babies terrible distress will come on this land and God's punishment will fall on this people and some of you will be killed by the sword and others will be taken as prisoners to all countries and the heathen will trample over Jerusalem until their time is up Jesus last week was a stressful week and he's in the middle of that stressful week you remember you probably all waved palm branches on Sunday in your church and the Sunday it was a public demo huge unruly crowds women children men young old lined the streets cheering as he rode into the city on the donkey on the Monday another demo more serious in the big temple he overthrew the tables of the money changers and drove out the vendors with a whip and back at their base in Bethany the disciples now emotionally charged had emotionally charged suppers with very big issues arising in their conversation on Tuesday he taught and had long debates in the temple with unfriendly political and religious leaders then on Wednesday on the way either down the Mount of Olives going into the city or up the side of Mount of Olives coming out of the city he stopped for a rest and they all sat down and they looked out over the valley and saw the temple on the other side some of you have been there temple that took Herod 46 years to build and the disciples commented on how beautiful it was and what large stones were used in its construction. I've seen one of them, 15 meters long, one stone. To the surprise, when they were admiring it and say how wonderful it was, he comes back and said it was going to be destroyed and not one stone would be left on another. What a shock. Apart from its impregnable mass on the hill, it was a house of God. His special place. And God would never allow it to be destroyed, they thought. So, I think, they jumped to the conclusion and assumed that he must be talking about the end of the world and they asked him when that was going to be and how they would know when it was going to happen so they telescoped what he said about Jerusalem with the end of the world and asked a dual question and to their surprise he started listing things that they had never thought about. And it happens to be the very things that are very much on the agenda of world vision. Wars. Revolutions. Earthquakes, if we could add today's tsunamis. Famines. Plagues. Other natural and man-made disasters. Family breakdowns false teaching, persecution of believers, and alarmist propaganda. This seemed like the end of the world stuff, and a long way away. And he said that these were the things that Christian would have to cope with all the time until that end of the world. And these are the things that World Vision is consistently engaged with, both in child care relief and development 
now abruptly. In the middle of this seemingly long-term outlook, he comes back to their question about the temple. About the temple being destroyed, and he implies that will be soon, and it might be soon enough for some of them to be involved. Now this is not the first time he said this kind of thing. This is in fact the third time. And there will be a fourth. The references are in Luke 13, 19, 21 and then in 23. And we happen to know that this actually happened less than 40 years later in AD 70. In fact, the destruction of Jerusalem happened and the second coming didn't. And I wish the preachers would remember that. Because I think lots of the time they're talking about signs pointing to the end of the world and the second coming of Christ when they're actually looking at what they should be paying attention to and doing something. They were to act in the immediate and not get preoccupied with the last days. Where does it say? Verse 14. This will be your chance to tell the good news in the middle of the disasters. Yes, Jerusalem was in a mess. And Jesus spoke about it a lot in that last week of his life and the journey leading up to Jerusalem. They had four areas of trouble. Listen hard. Play-acting religion. Economic selfishness. Unavailable justice. And intolerant ethnicity. Sound familiar? What did he do? call a commission of inquiry? Did he put for a man, both a manifesto? Did he get them all to take an oath? To do something about it? Did he write books? Did he issue reports in big words? No. What did he do? He died for them. On the cross. And when he rode on the third day, he sent his pretty devastated followers to go out and preach what? Social justice? Repentance. You did it said Peter on the day of Pentecost. You did it. And God now commands all men everywhere to repent. And took all that time talking about how bad Jerusalem was and how it would be destroyed. And what did he say to them before he left them? Start at Jerusalem. It's one of the great paradoxes that preachers don't bring out. He prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem and said, start in Jerusalem. And in less than 40 years, Jerusalem was gone and the church was nowhere. Fortunately, a man, Paul, came and took the gospel out of Jerusalem. Never could get his toe in back in Jerusalem. God saw to it that he kept his work out there. And so the gospel spread in all the world. Now, I could talk a long while about this. But what was happening then, this was the second destruction of Jerusalem. The first we read about in the books of Jeremiah, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and Ezekiel. Way back. And what was happening then, when the first destruction of Jerusalem taking place, was there was a shift taking place in history. And if you go into your Bible, you'll find a lot of strange names, Edom, and Ammon, and Moab, and Chaldea, 
and Babylonia and Persia and many others. And the boundaries of all these nations were shaking and were changed. And a new era came in that started off with the Assyrians and Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans. The destruction of Jerusalem was only a part of a shift in history. Now you will not be able to remember a lot of things that I can remember. I find that when I'm talking to people. <laughs> but you can remember five years, can't you? Six years. And we've had nothing but trouble for six years. Is there a shift taking place in history? I think there is read one book that says that all these straight lines in Africa that were decided in the Berlin Conference at the end of the 19th century are going to be scrubbed and go back to more natural boundaries in the next 50 years. Possible. You just think where the troubles are taking place just now? Mali? Hmm? C.A.R. Mauritania and all the countries in the Middle East where we have what's called an Arab Spring all of which were countries where the Christian church was strong in the early days and the imperial powers determined the borders in that area now we've been going since nine, 2007, what does that make? It makes it six years, and if you listen to the news today, it's not going to stop anytime soon. And we're in Kenya. And the great thing about Kenya was it didn't have anything like that until PEV. And now we're all wondering, okay, are we in for a second installment? We hope not. We're praising God for the amount of effort that has been put in to retain the peace. And so far he's answered our prayers. And we hope he still will. But you see, you mustn't think of Kenya as where it's all happening. Kenya's only a part of what's happening. What we need to be asking about Kenya is, is there sufficient repentance for God to withhold his hand of judgment so that we don't get a repeat of PEV? See, I'm only a Mgeni. But I come and I see that the PEV was nothing other than Kenya reaping what it sowed. When I say that, people agree. And then I ask myself, have we sowed anything different in the last five years? And I'm not sure. So the question is, is our repentance deep enough to forestall another judgment? Because in some ways, the last five years have been worse. And in some ways have been better. We've had no opposition, and so corruption has increased. Everybody says it. So we're in the shift, I think. It doesn't need to be true for what I'm going to say. Just think where we are now. I'm going to mention some countries. Shoot up your hand if you think there's any good news from Syria, South Sudan, Nigeria, Egypt, Pakistan, Israel and Palestine, Afghanistan, Somalia, Mali, Tunisia, Cyprus, Bahrain, DRC, Zimbabwe, CAR, Libya, Yemen, and the Eurozone. 
don't see any hands. So what? So what? Habakkuk was the one who said, when Habakkuk complained about what was going on, he said, look at the nations. And nobody is better placed to look at the nations than the people in World Vision. You get more news than most. I'm glad to see that in Kenya there's remarkable growth and health and progress in many churches that I don't hear about elsewhere. Can this make a difference? Can Kenya give a lead? Or will we be like Judah in Habakkuk's day and let religious revival run alongside deepening corruption and all-embracing culture of impunity and injustice? Well, disasters and relief, and all these things mentioned in the Olivet Discourse that I read the beginning of, call for a particular kind of Christian. I'm going to refer you to the, the passage. This kind of Christian is described in this chapter, and I'm going to list eight characteristics very quickly the kind of people we ought to be when we're in the middle of shifts that are coming as a result of the judgment of God. Verse 8, be on guard. Do not be deceived. We need to be alert, savvy, yenye akili. We need of clear thinking, cool-headed, we need to be contingency planners, thinking ahead, anticipating the kind of things that may happen and taking measures against them. That's the one. Second, do not be afraid. Verse 9, we have to be courage. Have courage. Be brave and bold people. Timid people cannot do this. It says, verse 13, 13, this will be your opportunity, the chance to tell the good news. We need to be genuine, articulate Christians without sham or half measures. Christians who are able when called upon to articulate the truth of the gospel. You mustn't leave it to your pastors. Verse 14, make up your minds beforehand not to worry about how you will defend yourselves. We need to have thought about what we are doing and be secure and calm in the way we go about things and very determined. Number five, verse 16, some of you will be put to death. We need to be ready to die. I landed in Africa 40 years ago. If you could get rid of two fears, you were ready for anything. One is the fear of poverty, and the other is the fear of death. And the people who don't fear poverty and don't fear death will be invincible if they have the power of God in their lives. Why do we have growing terrorism in the world today? Why does it not get put down? Because terrorists don't fear death. And the subjects of terrorism do. <laughs> Until we have a cadre of people who fear death less than those who are causing the trouble, we will lack the moral quality to overcome terrorism. Banish fear of poverty and the fear of death and all other foes will seem feeble. We may die as Jesus suggests, but not unprepared and not in fear. Number six, stand firm, he says in verses 18 and 19. He that endures to the end will be saved. We need to be stable, patient, persevering. Number seven, we need people, people of a simple lifestyle. Be on your guard. Don't let yourself become occupied with too much feasting and drinking and with worries and the cares of this life verse 34 a simple lifestyle may be inevitable once you are on the spot but Jesus is saying saying it ahead of time 
that these are the people who will bear an adequate testimony in a disaster relief situation. I can tell you because I was here, the lifestyle of middle and upper middle class citizens of Kenya is a way far above and beyond anything the settlers ever knew. <laughs> We've had a revolution. You know what a revolution is? 360 degrees. You're back facing the same way you were when you have a revolution. And when I look out on my congregations that I see, the solution to the problems there, that's where the money is. Because they didn't listen to this word. And then number eight, we need to be praying people. Be on the alert and pray always that you'll have the strength to go safely through these things. Verse 36. These are the people who have an inner source of power. They're strengthened by might, by the spirit in the inner man. They walk with God and it shows how in regular prayer. That's the kind of Christian crisis times calls for. Luke 21 is about bad news. False religion is bad news. War is bad news. Revolutions, earthquakes, famines, disease, persecution, all of these things are bad news. The fear of which the media are not slow to tell us about. But the churches are in the business of bringing good news. as soon as possible after and even during the bad news. And in this way, the people in each disaster area where we send our relief agents, we have a demonstration as well as an articulation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, I believe, is the biblical context for the kind of work you do in World Vision. May God give you grace to do it. And I made it.